Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us here tonight for this Gailey Health Facebook Live to talk everything education when it comes to the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Natalie Hayden. I am a Gailey Health ambassador. I've had Crohn's disease for over 15 years. I'm also an IBD mom. I have a three and a half year old son named Reed and a one and a half year old daughter named Sophia. My son is back in person preschool right now. So that's my perspective tonight. But before we get started, I wanna give you a little bit of background about what exactly Galley is. For those who don't know, it's an app that enables you to proactively track and manage your disease and see where you start you know, with your medication and, and figuring out if there's a trigger in your life that is maybe complicating your symptoms. It also allows you to connect with fellow patient advocates and patients in the community that you maybe not be able to meet in person ever, but are able to reach through the touch of your fingertips on your phone. So it's such an amazing access point. Uh, before we get started tonight, I wanna introduce everybody here. We have patients that are teachers, parents, and students. So Maisha, why don't you take it away? Good evening, everyone. My name is Maisha Malone King. I'm a parent of four kids. I've had Crohn's disease for 11 years. I'm a Gali Health Ambassador. And I run the Facebook group, Game of Crohn's and Chronic Illness. I'm Krista. I have Crohn's disease um, since 2001. I have an ostomy. I am a kindergarten teacher. I've been teaching kindergarten for six years now. And I returned back to teaching in the classroom. Hey everyone, my name is Amber and I run the YouTube and social media platform, The Ostomy Diaries. I have Crohn's disease and an ileostomy and I am a high school biology teacher. This is also my sixth year in education and I decided to um, go back and teach in person as well. And hi, my name's Andy. I have had Crohn's disease for about 15-ish years. I have a permanent ileostomy, um, and I am a graduate student online this year. So this is my first year online and as graduate student. Wonderful. And you're also a nurse too, Andy, right? <laughs> yes, I am. I'm actually pursuing my master's of science in nursing to do family nurse practitioning. And good for you. And before we get started tonight with the discussion, just a little disclaimer that we will be sharing our personal opinions tonight, our experiences, but they do not reflect the teaching institutions of the educators on this panel. And Andy, of course, is the only one with a medical background. So please do keep that in mind tonight. Uh, first of all, we're going to get started with the experience for students. How are you staying focused and motivated during this time of learning at home? I try to really separate school from home things. And so I still get dressed and brush my hair, do my teeth, you know, make sure even if nobody's gonna, you know, see me or talk to me really to that, I am setting up myself for success as if I'm going to school. So that way I can be successful. It puts you in that right headspace. Um, I also have a separate area for studying and I absolutely do not study or do any sort of work on my bed because that just messes with your circadian rhythm, rhythms and then you're less likely to be able to sleep and get a night's sleep because you're constantly thinking of your school stuff while, you know, getting those schedules jumbled up. Yes, yeah, so you definitely need that division between home and school, which is so hard when people are doing everything in one place. So I, I do think that's great. Showering, I think, and getting in clothes makes a big difference than just staying in your pajamas all day. It just changes mm -hmm. your whole frame of mind. Yes, absolutely. And as someone with IBD, do you prefer, if you had a choice to be online or in school right now, what would your choice be? I think because I'm also more introverted than some of my extroverted friends that I absolutely love uh, online schooling because I can kind of set my own schedule. If I'm not feeling very well, I can just curl up on my bed or my couch with my computer and read my books and, and things like that. I don't have to put on this facade that I'm really healthy or something in class, you know, while you're sitting there in class trying to listen and all you can think of, oh my gosh, I really have to go to the bathroom. Is my bag leaking? Is This isn't feeling well. And so you're actually missing out. I feel like a lot in class when you have IBD and you're like flaring or anything versus here, I can put my stuff down. My bathroom is right here and it's my own personal space. Um, so you're not having to go use a public area. Makes all the difference. And look who we have here, Brooke Abbott, our fellow student and parent. Thanks so much for joining us, Brooke. She was caught up in LA traffic. We can only imagine with all that's going on out there with the wildfires right now. Brooke, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing okay. Thank you for asking. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I'm sorry, I didn't get to do yes, sound check. It's wonderful. all dark in here because I just ran in like a <laughs> bat out of hell. Yeah, because we're talking about student life right now. So you 
to answer a couple questions for us as well. Um, how are you staying focused and motivated right now as a student, but also a parent? Yeah, it's, it is actually a little bit difficult um, with, you know, just trying to balance that, that space and also just the amount of time that I put into parenting and then also studying. Um, I actually just found this really great app. It's called Shovel app. And I am able to put in everything that's on my calendar, self-care time, time with Jackson, uh, work, um, advocacy, all my appointments, my medication, everything. And then within that time, it shows me how much time I have to study. And that's been very helpful because it also kind of lets me see like how much I'm actually spending time with my son and focusing on him and then how much time I'm actually spending in school and the amount of time that I'm wasting, even though I have no time to waste. So that's actually a good thing, I think. <laughs> There's only 24 hours in the day, but somehow we fill them all up doing something. So as far as staying organized, that's a way to organize time. How do you guys organize your space as students in your household? So I set up a different area for a desk. So we have our room and I will sometimes use my desk or I have clean off our kitchen island and it's like, okay, this is my spot and I'll spread my books out and all my papers and my agendas and my sticky notes. And I just kind of have this little area that I plant myself there and that's my space for the day. Yeah, I kind of have the same situation. Um, I got my son one of those rolling carts. And so he's able to put all of his stuff into that. So there's his books and, and everything that he needs for the day. And then there's another kind of like cart that he can just kind of push that has um, a small printer, extra paper, little snacks and things like that, because I can't always get up and just, you know, get a snack. I, I, and now we're lunch lady, we're snack lady, we're PE coach, <laughs> it's, it's all interesting. So um, for me, um, because a lot of my classes are in the evening, um, I'm able to kind of take it, take up the dining room area. And that gives me some space to really be able to like kind of spread out and, and um, also keep an eye on the household. That's the biggest thing. If I just kind of set up shop in my room, um, I probably would have all kinds of things coming to my house from Amazon. Um, the dogs would probably be all over the place and there would just be a lot of chaos and um, all the ice cream would be gone. So I like to still be in charge of the house by setting up um, in the middle and then just making sure that we're both um, kind of contained. So uh, a lot of like little carts, a lot of little um, boxes and stuff that we can put stuff in and he can easily maneuver it, especially, um, you know, one thing I've learned is I've got to keep my kid mobile, at, you know, being a parent because I never know when I'm going to get sick or when, you know, things are going to happen. So I need someone to come in, you know, as a single parent, I need someone to come in behind me and be able to take up his whole life and move him, you know, to where he needs to be while I'm taking care of myself. So, um, okay. yeah, we're still, we're still in a mobile type of situation, even though we're at home. That's great. I love that he can be self-sufficient and have all his, it must make him feel good too, to be organized and not stressed out knowing, you know, this is where my books are. These are where my supplies are. This is where I can get snacks. I love that. And one last student-based question for tonight. Are you experiencing any difference in how you take care of yourself when it comes to your IBD? <laughs> I know that's a loaded question. <laughs> I definitely feel like I have slowed down a little bit because I'm not having to rush to class or rush to, you know, commuting or sit in traffic. I can sit there and as I'm studying, be like, oh, you know what, I, I need to do this or I need to do this. I can slow down and kind of focus on myself a little bit more or like kind of tune into what my body's telling me. Like, oh, I need to take a nap. Well, my couch is right there. It's not like I have to go home or anything and fight through it. I could take a five minute nap if I need it. Um, so I actually think it's been helpful in that way. Um, but it's also getting the motivation to get back up from that slow pace and hit the books again is also very difficult. So it's finding this good balance between the two. Yeah, I think it's all about balance. Um, unfortunately, because I've got that, you know, extra element of evening time, that's really the only time that, you know, Jax has with me. Um, it's kind of hard to like, not have to have that structured time of going to school and also and I know a lot of parents can kind of relate to this like when you're the you know a stay-at-home mom at first um and you don't have that commute that quiet car ride <laughs> where you can like listen to music or just kind of like decompress you're just kind of going from one end to the other and I, sometimes I kind of feel like 
not having that break of going to campus and seeing other people and having that socialization, um, it kind of almost feels like I'm back in that, that, you know, space of from when he was born to two years old of being a stay at home mom. And, you know, all it was, was my commute was from my bedroom to my living room, to the right. laundry room. <laughs> all right. That's really how it is. That's a good way to explain it. Now, Amber and Krista, you guys are both teachers. Are either of you in person? Krista, I believe you are. Amber, are you? Yes. All right. So this is really interesting, I think, to get your guys' perspective. What measures are you taking right now? I'm assuming both of you from your medication are immunocompromised. So being an educator who's immunocompromised in the middle of the pandemic with students, Krista, you have kindergartners, Amber, you have high schoolers. How have you guys proactively tried to keep your classroom safe? Well, for me, um, I'm lucky that this year my class size has actually reduced quite a bit. Um, so I do have a smaller class size, which has allowed me to um, physically distance all of my students and myself. So I have kind of like a teaching space. I have a square on the, I've taped um, on the floor and that's my teaching square. And I kind of, I teach from that square. I can remove my mask so they can see my face, especially um, important for students who are learning English or if there's any disabilities. So um, I've kind of done those things, but I've also taken, um, even though I've maybe allowed to do certain things in kindergarten, I've kind of held off on those things for now, just to see how the year progresses. So same for me, um, my district was really good about setting up the classrooms in such a way where if we can't social distance that, you know, recommended six feet, they've got the shields bolted to the desks. I've got the shield, you know, the clear barrier on my desk. Um, I, I just haven't felt comfortable to take my mask down yet while we're inside, but they are recommending that we do a lot of outside activities. So, you know, being a biology teacher and, you know, the ecology unit, all that, I've been trying to plan some activities outside so they can distance and get a break from wearing their mask constantly and have fun because, you know, school isn't as fun as it used to be. So um, I just sanitize all day long. Um, and then I actually bought one of those speakers. It's kind of like what travel guides use in um, like city tours when you're on vacation or whatever. And I put like the microphone in my mask because they couldn't hear me. And I have some EL learners as well. And so I just, I was like, they need to be able to hear me. I'm not taking my mask off yet. So like, it was kind of funny at first. They were like, Miss Ogle, you've got a speaker, and they were laughing, but now they're used to it, and it's been a great yeah. tool to help, you know, me feel safe, but still be effective in giving instruction, so. Yeah, and I know, you know, with the summer, there was so much debate, so much worry, so much uncertainty, there still is, but before the start of school, what to do? Should we go back? Should we be in person? Should we be at home? How did you guys feel leading up, and do you feel comfortable with where you're at right now? Uh, leading up to school, I was very nervous, um, very anxious. Um, I lost a lot of sleep. Um, I cried a lot. Um, but after finding out that we were going back to near normal, I kind of sat with it. Um, I've talked to different people about it. And I, find, I talked to my, my medical team and they kind of gave me the go ahead that you know, I am the healthiest I've ever been. Um, so if the time isn't to go back now, you know, there wouldn't be any other time. So I decided even just for my mental health to just be back in the classroom, have more of a regular routine um, that I made that decision to go back. And I feel like right now I'm happy. I'm comfortable with the decision. And I also should maybe add that I live, I'm in Canada, I teach in Canada, so that might kind of make, I don't know, that might make a difference. What about um, you, Amber? I debated, um, I actually 
applied to be a virtual teacher and was accepted um, due to having Crohn's disease. Um, but, you know, I discussed it with my husband and for my mental health really played a lot for me um, because I began to feel depressed and um, it was something that I had a lot of anxiety about going back in those first few days back, you know, heart beating super fast, being around people. It was an adjustment. It's so weird to me how, you know, we're created to be relational beings for the most part, but then those first couple weeks and days being around more than just my immediate family really caused a lot of anxiety for me. And it was an adjustment period. Um, and I just, you know, take it minute by minute, one step at a time and wash my hands and try to take all the precautions. But it wasn't an easy decision. And I think there there is no set right or wrong. It has to be a personal decision for you, where you live, what your family dynamic is. Um, so, you know, I just did what was best for me uh, at the time and the situation that I'm in. And so far, I feel safe, you know, all the kids are being, they're being great about wearing their mask because they want to be there and they know that that's our, that's at least one defense we have against the unknown. So I'm feeling pretty safe so far. You feel as though the stress at all has been a trigger for your IBD? You know, when you walk into school at the beginning of the year, maybe that first few days, did you feel different than you had been staying at home? Just that that anxious feeling or did that trigger anything within you other than your mental health being improved? <laughs> well, for me, when I'm anxious, I feel like my ostomy output automatically increases. So, you know, that is something that I had to be aware of. Um, and I kind of let my fellow science teachers around me know that way, you know, if I needed a break and couldn't leave the kiddos by themselves, which I can't, um, that I could call on them and rely on them. And they're so supportive. I feel like you know, if one, one thing positive from the coronavirus is people are having each other's backs for the most part, at least in my career setting. Um, so that was something for me that I had to get used to, you know, oh, I'm not just at home and can go to the bathroom whenever I need to. So I kind of have to plan that. And that's, you know, having it off me in general, but those nerves did add to my increased output for me. <laughs> I'd say the same as Amber um, and also like the um, phantom rectum that kind of triggers a lot more when I'm anxious. Um, so I also have um, co-workers that I can count on um, that can just take over the class for, for a few minutes because I'm lucky that the bathroom is actually right next to my classroom. That's perfect. It's truly a team effort and the power of community is just exemplified so largely now. I feel that everybody realizes that they really do have to lean on one another, maybe just six feet apart. Now, for parents that are tuning in tonight whose children have IBD, who are immune compromised, uh, whether they have IBD or not, it could be a different chronic illness that suppresses their immune system. Uh, what advice do you have for parents who have decided to send their children in person are very nervous about the decision, but do feel that that's what's best overall for their child to have the structure, the instruction, that sort of thing. What words of, of calm, calmness and just, you know, reassurance would you have for them? Well, I think most importantly is making sure your kids are well protected, making sure that they have the proper utensils that they need to protect their self as well as others. I'm real yeah, strong. Hold on, that communication has to start at home, right? So where yes, the man? I'm real, I'm real strong on sanitizing, washing your hands. It's hand soap all over my house. I get up every morning and wipe my house down from top to bottom. I don't play. Like, I'm real strict on that. I'll be like, y'all know my immune system weak. You sneeze on me, I'm getting sick. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Sanitizer all over my house. I have lights all over my house, bleach all over my house, baby wipes, Lysol wipes. Got to be proactive about it. I always make my son read now that he's in preschool. You know, the minute he walks in the car, we have sanitizer that has a little dinosaur on it. He knows to put it on right away. Then as soon as we get home, he changes his clothes, washes his hands. Um, he's week three into preschool, uh, loving it. I just see a light in him that I haven't seen since he left school March 11th. And I was apprehensive as well, of course, of sending him. But I started thinking, you know, I feel like 
the benefits of being with his peers, of learning just the basics that a three-year-old needs to learn. Um, just having that camaraderie with his little friends, it, it, I think done wonders for his behavior and just his overall mental health as well. But I think it's something that you truly have to think about what's best for you and your family. And you might get flack from friends and family that say, you know, I know for me, people were joking with me in the early months of the pandemic saying, oh, Natalie's like Sergeant COVID in our family. And now some family members are saying, why would she send Reed to school when she was so scared and worried and extra cautious before? And I think we've all evolved through this pandemic. And it's not that I'm less worried, but I feel a little bit more confident in how we are managing it as a family and how we're going to find a new sense of normalcy within that and thrive because of what's going on. So I don't want to live in right. fear. I want to restrict my family from everything because of me. So I thought, I think all of us, you have a guilt when you have IBD and you're immune compromised and maybe everybody else in your family is healthy, you know, and you have to kind of take, they have to take the brunt of everything you go through. So I think there's some give and take that goes on with this. So it's not an easy balance, but we're all trying to navigate and do our best. And I think just having that empathy for others, uh, regardless of what their decisions are. And so many of us, I know all of you guys are active on social media and you might be getting DMs as a teacher saying, what are you doing going back to school? Or Brooke, what are you doing right now trying to go to school when you should focus on your son Jackson? You know, we might get messages from people who don't walk in our shoes and may question what we're doing. And these are tough times as it is. So I think we all need to be a little bit more empathetic of one another and what those decisions are and the reasons behind them. So how have you calmed your fears? For those of you that have children, how have you calmed their anxieties about the pandemic? I think we, me. we really, oh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, you can go ahead. I was gonna say, I, I treated okay. this as I treated IBD. I was very honest um, with him about what was happening and what could potentially happen. And then I asked him questions and, and allow him to ask questions. The biggest thing is, I think, what I found from a young age with um, talking to my son about IBD and then dealing with his own, he has asthma, so dealing with his own asthma and getting him to feel comfortable with both um, has been communication and allowing him to have the freedom of communication. So he's allowed to ask questions. He's allowed to know that he can show concern. He can express concern. Um, and when we see things that aren't necessarily true, we address them. Um, I don't really hide uh, things from him because I feel like when you do that, then that, you know, kids create things in their heads and they, you know, exactly. it, it'll get bigger than it actually is. And so um, I, I know that he was afraid of going back to school. His school is not in school just yet, like they're still online, um, but he's also an actor. And I didn't want him to feel like he needed to be scared to go back to work because I knew that, well, when it comes down to money, they're going to make sure that everybody's safe, you know, mm -hmm. and I didn't want him to go into a situation where he felt like I, no one's taking care of me or no one's going to pay attention. And I also didn't want him to not have the proper information to be able to communicate his fears. So communication is always number one. I agree with that because my kids are very open and honest with me. They talk to me. I let them know that I'm their parent first, their friend second, and they always come and talk to me about things. But when the pandemic first happened, we had a discussion about what it is, how it's transmitted or how we thought it was transmitted. They knew that I was immune compromised. So they were like, okay, well, we always wash our hands and sanitize, but how can we protect the household? How can we protect you from getting sick? My husband was and me were talking and making plans of how we would handle and combat things, how we would face things if we were presented with the kids going back to in-person hybrid school. But it wasn't a decision for me. It was online only because I know my youngest son, he, he, he likes to touch things. And with me knowing that he likes to touch things, I didn't want him potentially bringing back anything that could harm me, his sisters and brothers, his dad or anybody that might come over to visit, but people don't really come to my house no way because I'm not getting sick from nobody. I let them know. Like when they had the swine flu, I had sanitizer attached to my mailbox and signs on my doors. Like it's really bad with me. I think I'm experiencing mom guilt and a little bit of fear because my kids are pretty much homebodies. 
like they like to do things but for the most part they in their own element they're anime kids and they like to read manga and they're they're their own little people but I also try to assure them they don't have to be scared to leave the house but they don't want to leave the house because they got their own little anxiety and worries that they have that they might get sick because I'm immune compromised and we have you know I'm trying to adjust them to the fact that they don't have to be scared to just interact with God and play long as they take precautions to protect themselves but then they still at the end of the day is how it's going to put how it's going to affect mommy and I have to let them know that you can't worry about me I'm the mom y'all the kids that's a really great point Maisha I think we often forget that our children, whether they're one or they're 20, they might be bottling up a lot of the emotions of the, being scared about the fact that, hey, I know my mom or my dad is immune compromised. I know my aunt or my uncle isn't one of the healthy people that we're talking about. Exactly. They're one of the people that may be at risk here. So how are they thinking about that? How are they internalizing that fear? What types of thoughts creep into their mind? And I think we all, once you have children and you have IBD, you see from such a young age that they have this compassion within them that they just innately have because that's all they know. Um, so I think it's just important that we all are mindful of what our little ones are doing, no matter how little or big they are and what they're thinking and really take time to communicate like Brooke said, because they might be having so many fears and worries that we're not even thinking about. We have our own fears or worries and we might just think they're sad about not going back to school when in fact they're scared about you going to the grocery store because they don't want mommy to be hospitalized. So and my I think kids worry a lot. They are worry wards. My sons hug me 50 billion times a day. My daughter constantly asking me, mommy, are you okay? My husband constantly asking me, are you okay? Are you feeling okay? And me, I have a habit of just running on films because I don't know how to slow down and I have to learn how to pace myself because I'll constantly move from one task to the next task to the next task and I'm a stay-at-home mom so I'm always hands-on and I have to learn how to you know take time for myself that's so that's I don't a do too often. segue is taking time for ourselves I'm also a stay-at-home mom um, and I do feel like whether you're a stay-at-home mom you're working in the office you're a teacher, a student. It's so hard right now to find the time for yourself, yes, even though so many is. of us are home. It almost feels like we're busier than we ever were before, even though people think, oh, you're working from home. This is going to be a breeze. I can throw in laundry. I can make dinner while I'm working. When you feel like you have to wear so many hats, how are you guys all juggling That's this true. and making sure that it's not a detriment to not only your mental health, but also your IBD? I have a schedule. For one, I'm real mean on scheduling, but I also try to, most time, even if it's just to play a game on my phone or try to find time in the bathroom just to take a breather, I try to do that. I don't do it often, but I try to remember that I got to take a breather at some point in time. For me, it was kind of two steps. I had to set boundaries because, you know, in the beginning, um, I'm teaching a new subject this year, um, tech issues, Google Classroom, there was so much going on that I could work 20 hours a day and still have something to do, I feel like, and I know you guys probably experienced that supporting your kids who are going through it. Um, I had to set boundaries and say, okay, these are, this is the hours I'm giving to this, this day or this week, and then in addition to that, stick to those boundaries, and um, one of my administrators told us, you know, when you find your limits, then you go home knowing that you did the best you can and you do what you need to do to rejuvenate yourself because your mental health or your faith or your family, that all comes before this career, you know, so that has to come first. And um, for me personally, I had to realize that the best that I can do isn't the best from last year because it's, you can't compare it. Um, so our best during COVID is not, it's not going to be perfection. And so we just have to make sure we're caring for ourselves and those around us. And I know that sounds cliche, but do the best you can do and then rejuvenate yourself. And so <laughs> I've been trying to stick to that and I know it's hard, but we have to set our limits and know our limits. Very true. That's great. And I think it's so important too to just get some fresh air, especially for most of us who are still dealing with nice summer-like or fall-like temperatures. <laughs> we can still get outside even if it's just 20 or 30 minutes a day. I know that that just 
makes my day so much better. And I can just breathe in some fresh air. Even with my, if my kids are with me, it's still a change of scenery. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, as we, as we move into the winter months, uh, whether it's teaching in a school or studying or trying to get your kids to focus, what are some of the fears you guys have as we move into the winter months and going outside might not be possible? If the pandemic is going to hit harder than it did the first wave, is it going to be more vicious with flu season, cold season coming around? There's lots of worries, that's for sure. Andy, being the medical oh. professional that you are, what are your thoughts? We definitely worry about the winter coming because my, my husband is also uh, in public health. And so we're both very intimately involved in COVID. Um, I see the patient, I've seen the patients, I've done the testing and he's seeing the stats and the numbers. And so both of us have this uh, perception of it. Um, and we both are anticipating it's gonna, you know, with flu and everything. It's just a super important time to take care of yourself and your own lung functioning. Um, so we're, we've told in our house, we're very, very strict and we are renting out a couple of our rooms. And so we're like, hey guys, you, you know, this is what is happening and this is what we are going to do for our house because this is the safest we can, we can be. And, you know, we don't want to jeopardize anybody's like social life or anything like that, especially with the winter months, you know, you get the winter blues. It's just kind of assuming how much risk do you want to take with each action um, it's kind of like in, in IBD, we always talk about spoons, like how many spoons do you want to use to take a shower or go, you know, out to eat? Well, you got to think of that with COVID risk, too. It's like, well, this risk only is a little bit, so that's okay. But, you know, if you do multiple things with big risks, you know, you're increasing your chances that can do you harm. And so with the winter months, we're like, okay, drink, drink water, take your vitamins, you know, uh, don't smoke, don't vape, if, whatever you're doing, just work on you know, your lung exercises really build up some of that um, uh, energy and that um, it's just really preventative for you. And so that way, if you do get sick, you're setting yourself up for success. And so that's what we've done a lot of is like my uh, husband and I have been working out together to like help with our mental health and you'll know, have some time together, but also because it helps our lung function. So that way, if one of us got sick, we have a better chance of coming out of it okay because our lungs are better functioning and better set up for success. Uh, Very interesting. And, and uh, back to just going back to school, of course, Amber and Krista, you are in school right now. Uh, my son's in school, but we all know that at the drop of the hat, that can change and we can all be back home. What are you anticipating just by how the first couple of weeks have gone? Do you think that you guys, are you hopeful that you'll make it through the winter in person? Or what do you think will happen if you had a magic ball? I don't think we'll make it through the winter, <laughs> but I live in a tourist town, so I'm maybe not the person to ask. I don't know. I think our, I mean, I'm surprised at how well it's going. I thought that it would have been worse at this point in time, um, but I do anticipate, I mean, I can't, you know, speak for my district, but I anticipate temporary shutdowns. It happens for influ influenza anyway, each year, at least for a couple of days, so I'm sure um, you know, they'll do whatever to keep the kids safe and to keep the staff safe. So I don't think we'll make it through the winter. Honestly, I, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, we have winter, um, for quite a bit of the year in Calgary. Uh, so I'm surprised there's no snow outside today. Um, so we're kind of hoping that things kind of, that we can stay in class, but, We've been all told to prepare or have things ready um, online in case that happens. So like our schools have, have gone really well. So fingers crossed that it stays that way. That's wonderful. It's, it's scary to think about what could happen and what could not happen. Who knows what's gonna happen, of course. But as far as just staying focused and staying motivated, how do you make sure that your kids are you know, doing what they need to do on the computer, getting the work done, while also being able to spend quality of time with them so you don't constantly feel like you're their teacher, even though you kind of are, but you're not. You're, you're wearing many hats right now, Maisha and Brooke. <laughs> I'm a sergeant when it comes to school. I don't play school first, friends later. I don't allow, I don't allow no devices during school week. I take it on Sunday, you get it back on Friday. I don't allow it. You are not, unless it's an emergency, you're not allowed with devices. If you need help with work, like my daughter, I'm really good in writing and English, science. So that part of the matter, my day always come to me, but my kids are good in math. My husband's good in math. I suck with math. 
So in that aspect, we try to we try to keep a schedule and know what they're doing. But my my eight year old, he's he's advanced, and a lot of the stuff that he's doing in school, like all my kids are straight A students, but a lot of the things that they're doing in school kind of bore them. So I have to keep re letting them know that you know you just can't walk away because you're in the house you know you're still in school and he'll tend to walk away and be like they're boring me and then I'm like you gotta you gotta stay there you gotta stay focused he was like but I did this already I understand that but you have to stay focused you have to stay there but we have every night at seven o'clock we have family movie time on the weekends on Saturdays we have family game night where we interact to play games or we do things as a family just to spend that quality time together we have family talks and family meetings about certain issues and things that affect us and they are free to voice their opinions because their opinion matter just as much as ours do in the home because we all share this home together it's not just me and dad it's them too and you know to make it work it takes a team yeah, um, I'm pretty, pretty much the same. Um, Education is really important in our family. Um, for you know, my son and his his peers, um, they kind of went from zero to sixty. I'm sorry, they went from sixty to zero very quickly. You know, when before school shut down, Hollywood shut down. Um, so a lot of these kids were working. They were kind of used to balancing sports, working, school. Um, you know, and, and really focusing in on that, you know, four to three to four hours of school only and then jumping out and working. Um, so there was a lot of adjustment. I think that having gone through the summer now and just kind of preparing for the adjustment, um, it's been easier. Uh, we do a lot of like I show him how much time it takes for him to do certain things. This teacher is also very good at that. There's a schedule up um, so that he can see when he's almost done. And because we don't have the library, because we don't have baseball, because we don't, you know, all of the auditions are, they're, they're coming back, but they're, it's very slim. Um, I've been trying to do just stuff around the house, you know, just trying to figure out stuff to do, you know, here in the neighborhood. And we take trips to Malibu and kind of like, that's our Friday is, that's our day to like, go study outside by the beach. And we literally will sit there and read and do all of our reading that day and do all of our games that day. And the weekend is kind of, you know, for us to be together. Um, this winter though, I'm preparing to transfer. And that's a scary thing. And I know a lot of parents who have kids who are 16, 17, you know, and up um, who are transfer, uh, transferring or applying to college. Um, this is a pretty scary time because we don't know what's going to happen next fall and trying to kind of figure out, like, are we really moving back east? Um, what's going to end up happening? Should I really stay local? Am I going to kind of, you know, change my plan again? Because initially I was in college, had to drop out because of IBD. And now I'm like, I refuse to drop out because of COVID. So, um I would suggest that I know a lot of moms and dads are really trying to figure out how to um, maneuver their their potentially college student kids. And um, I would say right now, let the colleges figure out how they're going to figure all that out, the dorm living and, and the scheduling and all that. They'll figure it out. Continue to push towards what you want. Apply to the schools that you want to go to. If you get in, fantastic, and then take it from there. If you think yeah, that you need exactly. to stay home and do online schooling through the college of your dreams, then do that. Do not compromise your dreams just because we're going to be in this. And we are going to be in this for probably another year. But as someone who did compromise her dreams, I'm telling you now that I'm on the flip side of that, you want to continue because life is going to happen. There's going to be another... COVID situation, there's going to be an, another pandemic, another attack, another something. There's always going to be something and you've got to figure out how to create a new normal within that something. So, um, you know, I would just highly suggest if you have elementary school kids, keep it as basic as possible as you can. You know, don't, it, it's, it is really hard for them to just kind of sit down all day. So keep it as basic, keep it as visual um, and be as forgiving on yourself as a parent and on your kids as possible. And then if your kids are planning on 
going to school and, and you know, furthering their education, um, push them to go to the school if they want to go to. It's going to be okay. Great message, that. Brooke. Great message. Yeah, I think that's so great. And I think it also kind of parallels what life is like with IBD. You know, we're given this lifelong diagnosis that has no cure and we're, we're, we have to think in the middle of our teens or maybe you're diagnosed as a pediatric patient or young 20 something right at the crossroads of being a youngster to being an adult. And you're thinking, what is this disease going to do for my life? And yeah. each of us has had these touch points throughout our patient journeys and we've had to pivot. We maybe had to do a detour. We maybe had to take a different way to get there, but we make it happen. So we might have a leg up on the average person when it comes to navigating something like this pandemic, because we're used to having the unexpected blindside us. We're used to having, oh, true. we're used to having to be extra careful. We've been immune compromised for years, washing our hands and doing these basic things is, is old hat to many of us. <laughs> so I think that we can use that to our advantage in a lot of ways and say, you know, I'm going to make this happen. I'm not going to make a compromise. I'm not gonna give up on school like Brooke is doing. I think that that's so inspirational. And I think that while these times are really pressing our mental health and are extremely challenging, and trust me, I, just like the rest of you, I don't wanna live through this much longer either. I want it to change. I wanna get back to normal. But I think that what we'll see is when we get through this, we will find and discover so much about ourselves, about our families, about our children, that we will think, you know what, maybe there was some good in what we went through. And it's just about having that kind of perspective, I think. And we can use our IBD to our advantage to be able to see how far we've come through the years and think, you know, in the, in the scheme of things in our lifetime, this will be a blip that we one day tell our grandchildren. We say, we'll say, we lived in a pandemic yes. while we were immunocompromised. I taught in a school in the middle of this. So I think that that's something that just to constantly think about and have grace for yourself and for others and just say, you know what, I'm having a bad day. I need to decompress. I need to do this for myself. If you need help, don't be scared to ask. I think as a mother, many of us are struggling right now too, because we don't want an outside person coming in to watch our kids so we can get some time to ourselves because we are all hunkering down. So there goes childcare out the window. Um, so a lot of parents are not getting any break. So it's 24 seven and they're wearing multiple hats. Um, you have the people, I know Andy, Amber and Krista, you guys are not parents yet, but you are dealing with your own struggles and everybody is dealing with something. It's not just parents that are struggling right now. Uh, I think teaching all the teachers, what you guys are going through, you're true superheroes. And especially you two who are, yes, you know, are. and facing this with such bravery and resilience and showing your students uh, that they are, can get through this too. I think that you're going to be a great role model for all of your kids. So I think it's something that you just have amazing, to amazing. what you're doing every day. You know, it's not easy what we're all doing. Uh, we're, we're in the middle of a pandemic with a chronic illness. You might have multiple chronic illnesses. I think the important thing is, is to focus on not flaring. I, I'm personally more nervous about having an IBD flare right now and being hospitalized alone than I am of getting COVID. Um, I think that there's just so many layers to this that we all have to think about, but I think just taking safety, being proactive, um, and doing what's best for you is what matters most. We have a couple more minutes, so I'm just going to let everybody leave kind of a final thought. Uh, we'll start with Andy, then we'll go to Amber, Krista, Brooke, and then we'll end with Maisha. Uh, kind of just some last thoughts about what you want people to take away from this. Uh, talk about your walk of life, where you are right now, and speak to that experience. So I love what you said about pivoting. It actually took me eight years to get my bachelor's in nursing um, because of Crohn's disease and having to drop school and start school. And I actually started school this year. It was totally out of the blue because of COVID. I was like, well, I can't really get a job as a nurse because it seems like all the jobs would open up, but they were closed down. They weren't hiring any, anybody anywhere. Um, and so I applied and got in and I was like, well, this must be where I'm supposed to be. And so I think it's just having that flexibility and knowing, you know, Everyone's in the same boat. Nobody knows what's going to happen. We, they throw out numbers and stats and everything, but really it changes every day. Um, and so just going forth every day, it's a new day. So what choices can you make in this day to make it a good day? And just at the end of the day, at, at the end, when you're going to bed, be like, I had a good day because I was able to do X, Y, and Z. And then you start over tomorrow and you just take it one day at a time. There is, right now, there is no long-term planning because there is no real end that we can see and like foresee in, in the moment. And so just take it day by day, take a deep breath. We're all trying our best. And that's really all we can do. So for me, um, just being an educator, um, 
giving grace, um, grace upon grace upon grace, these kids, you know, it being, I'm in graduate school right now, actually online. And so, you know, I just tell them, I'm like, you know, I know it's not fun being on a computer all the time. Um, and so just empathizing with them instead of, you know, just being the disciplinary and authoritative figure in their life saying, oh, you have to do this. These are the rules. I think just identifying with them and saying like, I know this is a struggle for you. It's a struggle for me too. And them seeing you as the adult and you admitting like, you know, this is hard for me too. I think they respect that. So, you know, give your kids some grace. And um, I just want to echo what Brooke said earlier about keeping that line of communication open, you know, as a parent, but you know, I let my students know they can talk to me because kids are curious and they're going to want to get their information from somewhere. And so um, we have to try to make sure that it's from the right place. So um, we just got to support each other and give grace when we can and take care of ourselves. And like High School Musical, we're on this together. I, I played that song at school to just try to make them laugh. <laughs> And they were like, who is this nut biology teacher? But I was like, we're all in this together. So. That song is perfect for what's going on now. Yeah. Um. Um, I guess for me is just to stay positive. Um, it's kind of been my motto since I was diagnosed with, with uh, Crohn's disease when I was nine. But, um, you know, every day is a new day, even just because maybe yesterday was a bad day doesn't mean that today or tomorrow will be better. Um, so really, um, you know, I even like to be positive in class or in, even in school, cause I, at the beginning of the year, I had, I made this big bulletin board and it said, welcome kindergarten to a bright new year. And one of my coworkers is, was like, is it really going to be a bright new year? I was like, well, if we don't believe it or we don't think it, it's not really gonna happen. Um, so, you know, just to stay positive in that just because yesterday was bad doesn't mean that tomorrow will be too. Well, I just echo what everyone has said so far. Um, I, you know, really want to speak to the single parents that are living with IBD, that are students, that are not students, that have students, that have, you know, that are caregivers. Um, this has been a really tough time trying to navigate um, everything, literally everything. And, and, and I, in that single parent umbrella, I'm also, you know, thinking about military spouses whose spouses can't come home now. You know, I, I always was kind of like, oh yeah, you know, I'm a single mom, but I didn't really take into account the fact that, you know, my parenting partner did come every month and was able to travel here whenever he wanted. And we were able to travel there whenever we wanted. And now it's been, you know, so many months and I'm literally doing it all by myself. Um, and I think that you have to give yourself a break. You have to be open and flexible to the, all the changes. Um, you have to not necessarily, I mean, we should all be diligent. But I think that sometimes we allow our fears to take over um, and that just becomes a little bit unhealthy. And so in our diligence, we should also allow for, you know, just, just a little bit of ease with everything because things are going to change, things are gonna evolve. And, um, you know, we've all figured out how to modify our life with IBD. We're just figuring out how to modify our lives again. And so with that, um, you can't stop living your life, and we can't um, we can't do all the things. We can't be all the things for everyone, and and that's okay. And if you need to take a break from certain things, take a break and um, release some of that guilt because we're all literally, like the song says, we're all in this together. It's all <laughs> it's so real. So you know, we're, musical we're, wisdom. Dude, yeah. <laughs> you nailed it with that because it's so true. We're, you know, uh, all of our circumstances are different, but we're all feeling it. We're all heavy. It's all our our weight is different, but it is weight, and we all have it. So, reach out to your friends. You know, reach out to your 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 girlfriends and your friends, and and to your fellow parents who you know 
your kids, parents, and and talk to them. How continue to have those, you know, once a week cyber happy hours. we we need to start doing that again with IBD moms. It was a stress reliever just for me and Amber yes. and whoever you know tuned in. It's important. So keep reaching out, keep connecting, keep listening, keep loving, and just keep enjoying. With me. Having IBD been a journey because at the highlight of my, my nursing career, being a registered nurse, I was forced to go on disability. And I, I don't think that was really my path because my whole family was a nurse. I felt as though my path was an advocacy. I felt more rewarding. I felt more joy. I felt more love than I've ever felt before. And being a parent, I was able to be more of a hands-on mom than I was when I was working because I was working so much and to me that's the greatest job that I could ever ask for being an advocate and being a mom I'm able to be there for my kids I'm able to answer their questions calm their fears hug them when they need to and just overall be present and if I had a message to the moms out there that have multiple kids and the teachers is just to be present but also be vigilant in your daily lives and everything that you're doing while staying safe. And then my motto is, if it ain't gonna matter in five years, don't spend five minutes of energy on it. I love that. Well, thank you all so much for participating tonight in this live discussion, really appreciate it. I know that everybody's tapped energy-wise, time-wise, you name it. So it means a lot to have all of your perspectives tonight. And I'm sure that your words of wisdom and your advice and just your personal experiences have helped somebody out there tonight. If you haven't done so already, be sure to download the Galley app. It is a wonderful place to connect with our community, to learn about your own IBD, to monitor and track your symptoms, to read different insights and articles. Uh, it's just a great resource in your toolkit for your own uh, disease management. So definitely check it out if you haven't done so already. And please stay safe, stay well, connect with us online. We're all over social media all the time. You know where to find us. We're here for you and we're all in this together. Have a good night. Good night.